Well, I think we'll get going here. It's 634 and I suspect more people will be joining us as um, the program can goes on. But tonight's program is on water and watering your gardening and conserving water. And Mike Heath, Master Gardener Mike Heath will be our presenter this evening. And he's got a pretty good show for us, some good information. I, I do have some concerns right now about our water situation. So far the spring has been on the dry side and April below average, May we're still below average. So we've got a lot to make up here. So we need some rainstorms. We don't need snow and we don't need cold, but having some, uh, some good rain would be wonderful. So this is a very timely program that Mike is presenting. And I think it's gonna be really important this year. So with that, um, I'm gonna turn this over to our Master Gardener, Mike Heath. Mike, it's your show. Hey, thank you, Catherine. And welcome everybody to the program tonight. Uh, talking about irrigation systems and watering your garden and conserving water. Uh, like okay. Catherine said, this is a pretty important uh, thing for us, uh, particularly to some progressives and as it relates to vegetables because they are, can be so finicky when it comes to water. Hey, Mike. Yes. Mike, could you talk, could you get closer to your mic? You're, you sound like no. you're far, far away from it. <laughs> no, I'm about as good as I can. The only thing I can do is just turn this off and plug the old system back in. Um, can you just talk loud? <laughs> okay. Give me a second. We'll start in just a second. I'll just turn the other one back, in, back on. Can you hear me through this one? Try, try again, Mike. Can you hear me through this one? Yeah, that's, that's a little bit better. Okay. This is the old system uh, that I was hoping to get away from tonight. <laughs> okay. Do I need to just start over? There you go. That's much better. Yeah, much clearer. Cool. Anyway, All right. We were saying uh, water is very important and Early on, we're talking so much about vegetables because there are a lot of folks that are planting vegetable gardens this year that haven't in the past, and they can really be finicky when it comes to water. Uh, too much, you drown them. Too little, they dry out and die. Uh, and the weather, you never can tell, but the later we get in the summer, the more critical it's going to be to uh, pay real attention to your water and uh, make sure your plants are getting exactly what they need. Basically, there's five different types of uh, irrigation systems. There's flood irrigation, overhead spray, mid-level spray, soaker hose, and drip tape slash drip tubing. And I'm going to hit uh, all of these. Flood irrigation, not quite so much because it's something you'll probably never use yourself. Basically, flood irrigation involves just flooding the whole field with water. Uh, you'll see this in rice paddies, uh, which of course we don't have here. Uh, travel down and around Missouri, though, a lot of rice paddies just right off the interstate, and you can see flood irrigation systems there uh, where the rice is being grown. And uh, this is a different type of flood irrigation here. Uh, it's a furrow irrigation. Now this is on soybeans out of Mississippi. But it's also used around Scott's Bluff on the corn. So if you're traveling up towards Scott's Bluff, uh, just look off to the right and left of the road, and you'll be able to see this kind of irrigation system as they're watering the corn with it. Not so much used here, uh, but it is a big deal over there where they've got the river and just pull the water right out of the river. Now overhead spray is one that we do see here. And uh, Okay, overhead spray is one that we do see here uh, a little bit, and it's not a very good system. Um, really, it just involves uh, spraying water out, 
kind of like the old yard waters we've all used for uh, so many years, the oscillators. Um, you lose about 40% of your water just to evaporation with these. And as just look at the photo on the right, you see the water is being sprayed up into the air, falls to the ground. Um, as dry as it is here, that water is going to just get sucked right up into the atmosphere. If it gets windy, it's even more. So it's possible that uh, you'll even lose more than 40% of your water to evaporation. And that's just money down the tubes. It also is an indiscriminate placement of water. Uh, it just means it, it throws it everywhere, uh, even in places where you don't want it. Um, now that doesn't mean that it doesn't have a place. And I do want to talk about that just real quick on that indiscriminate uh, placement of water. But the system here is actually being used for recovery. Uh, this is on my garden. And last year I got into a bad batch of uh, compost and found out about it act after the fact, after it was already dumped out. And it turned my garden sodic, which means the salt level was so high that nothing would grow. In fact, it was so high that weeds wouldn't even grow in the garden last year. Uh, on one hand, I guess that's a good thing because I didn't have to weed. On the other hand, I couldn't grow anything. And uh, there was about 1,800 corn seeds that just went to waste uh, in this part of the garden. Um, so the uh, electrical conductivity levels were about 4.3 last year. Uh, I do have them down to about 2.3 this year. And it's through this kind of watering system. The only way that you can get rid of that time kind of soil is by just throwing a lot of water on it and just pushing that, those salts down as low as possible. And last year, that entire end of the garden just stayed mud. And this is the type of watering system that I used on it. That's really about all it's good for. Uh, it puts excess moisture on the stems and leaves of your plants. And all that does is increases your potential for diseases and fungus. Here in uh, Wyoming, that's not as big a concern as in some other states because we are dry here. So things do dry out a little bit faster. But if you have any possibility of having disease in your garden, why would you want that? There's other what met methods that are uh, much better, the overhead spray system. Um, and if you like to weed, this is a good system because that indiscriminate placement of water waters your weeds really well uh, because it waters everything. And that's just added work for you. A mid-level spray system also uh, loses water to evaporation, not as high as overhead. Uh, and it's still not a good spray system, but it has a use. It actually puts the water under the canopy on the plants, but it's also indiscriminate watering. So it sprays water everywhere. Now, if you do have an area, uh, probably most likely in a flower bed, where you have a dense uh, layer of flowers, a mid-level work okay there because you're going to cover the entire ground uh, where you can't necessarily get to it uh, from a good placement like you will with vegetables. Uh, vegetables, your plants are spaced a certain uh, distance apart. Flowers, not necessarily so much. So the mid-level spray will work there quite well. This is the actual system for a mid-level spray. And this is about 14 inches tall. And this is a shaft right here. It's a stake that goes into the ground and you can uh, push it in as far as you want it to set the spray to height. This is the sprayer up here. Runs about 180 degree uh, semicircle uh, that it sprays out of. And this is a quarter inch tubing that went all the way to the bottom of it. You would see that there's a uh, barbed coupler on the bottom. What that's intended to do is be plugged into a hole that you punched into a half inch uh, poly uh, tubing. This also it gives you indiscriminate watering though and it will increase your weeds. A soaker hose, uh, those have been out for a lot of years and I'm sure everybody's familiar with them. Um, very little water loss due to evaporation. Uh, they actually place the water right on the ground, uh, almost where you want them. Uh, keeps the water towards the roots, therefore it's not going to go up into the air unless you have a leak. Uh, doesn't spread very far out. This is kind of a depiction here of the uh, water spread from a soaker hose. Uh, you can see the hose itself down the center. 
the water spread is not even on it, and basically that's not uh, any fault of the hose itself, but the ground is going to be different uh, just continuously, and it'll soak in better in some places than it will in others. So you're going to have a little bit of a jagged pattern. Uh, a soaker hose will go six to eight inches out on either side of the hose and then down. So you'll get a, a fairly decent water covering, but you can see just right off the bat, one of the drawbacks of a soaker hose is it soaks all the way along the length of the hose. This is because of all the pores that are in it. They just leak water. Uh, they don't emit water, they leak it. Uh, so you get water everywhere. If you have a plant, say right here, and then not another one until you get down here, and maybe down here, you're still watering all in between those plants, and so you're just watering your weeds in between there. The pores themselves do tend to clog fairly easily, which means you can't use these hoses to inject fertilizer. You're gonna to have to find another method to do that. You've gotta make sure these stay above ground. Uh, dirt will get into these pores, they'll clog them up, and then you don't get good water coverage. However, if they're above uh, or out in the sun, the sun rots the soaker hose. Uh, if you're lucky, you'll get two years. Uh, anything beyond that, you're just living on borrowed time. It's eventually going to break uh, because that rubber uh, does break down. And when it breaks, a lot of times it's just catastrophic. Uh, the entire end will come off or the hose will just break in half. And you may not even realize it since it doesn't shoot water in the air, but you're just pouring water out the end of it and uh, flooding one spot of your garden and everything else is not getting any water at all. Here we go to the drip tape. This is a very well uh, designed system. Um, I use quite a bit of it. Uh, in my gardens, uh, you can see here I'm using in between the rows of garlic. Uh, you get, again, very little water loss to evaporation. And the nice thing about uh, the uh, drip tape and drip tubing is it uses emitters, not pores in the uh, material. And emitters in the tape and tubing as well are spaced at specific intervals, uh, usually 6, 12, or 18. I uh, did find some online that was at 9 inches which makes it real easy if you're uh, planting seedlings because you can just uh, space your seedlings right there at the emitter and plant them right there and your water is going to go right to that specific plant. The emitters will clog, but they don't clog very easily. Uh, and that means that you can use it to inject fertilizer. And I did this uh, last year in the greenhouse. It worked just fine. There's no problems whatsoever Put the fertilizer through it. Uh, you can bury these underground. Uh, and the dirt won't get into the emitters to clog them up very easily. Uh, they can go under fabric if you're using fabric in your gardens, or, or you can place them under mulch. And it's kind of hard to tell. These here are above the mulch, and this is below the mulch over here. The drawback on the uh, drip tape is you can only use it in a straight line system. Uh, it, doesn't curve. It's a. It's literally a tape. Uh, when it's when the water coming through it, it's flat. You can't bend it into a curve. Uh, so straight line is all you can get out of it. And if you want to make any other designs, you have to put fittings on the end of it and make that design using fittings to get it turned around. The water pattern on the tape is with you got a emitter here. You're going to get about six to eight inches on either side, right there at the emitter. And the beauty of that is it's putting it at the roots of your plants and it's not watering your weeds in between. And depending on what you're planting, you can actually plant one over here and then come over to the other side of your tape, plant over here. And so you can get two plants in a single row. Uh, there again, that depends on what you're putting in there. Not everything uh, will allow you to do that. Drip tape is very, very easy to install. I'll show you some of the connectors here in just a second. Uh, and they just, in a lot of cases, just push on, clamp them down, and it's installed and you're ready to go. Uh, one thing about drip tape, as good as it is, it's very lightweight and it will break. Uh, so you got to be careful with that. If you bend it, um, you can weaken it right there at that bend. It'll crack and break. Uh, 
and you'll see that through the water just shooting up into the air. I found an easy way to fix this. Uh, it's not the best way necessarily. The best way is, of course, with a coupler uh, and splice two pieces together. But you can take some plumber's Teflon tape, that's that white uh, Teflon tape, put a couple of wraps around your hole, and then take some electrical tape and just tape the white tape down and go about an inch on either side of it. It won't totally stop the leak. We still have some water seepage out around it, but it does a real good job and it's a lot cheaper than buying a coupling every time you have to uh, repair this. Nice thing about drip tape, it lasts a long time. Uh, it might have been in now for three years uh, and it's still just like it's brand new. Here are some of the drip tape system components. And to start out with, I talked about how thin the walls are on the drip tape. And because of that, you've got to have a pressure regulator coming out of your hose to go to the drip tape. The water coming out of a hydrant or off a house can run anywhere from 40 to 60 PSI um, of pressure. And the hose will take at most 15. So if you put that str uh, pressure straight into that hose, all you're gonna do is blow it up. So you've got to have a pressure regulator to uh, put on there first. They're fairly cheap. Um, I think they're about $10 or so, uh, but it saves your tape. And before you hit pressure regulator though, you want to run a filter. That just helps keep your uh, emitters from getting clogged. But I have yet, uh, as, as bad as my water is, and I've got a lot of uh, minerals in my water, and even running irrigation, or not irrigation, but fertilizer through the system. I have yet to clog a filter or any of the drip tape at all. And you can see here, this is a piece of the tape, and you can see how flat it actually is when there's no water in it. When you've got water running through the tape, it will uh, blow up so that it's around two. But when it's just flat, or when it's just dry with no water, it's just flat uh, and goes back to that. Uh, there are several connectors that come with these. Now, these are quick connect connectors. Um, I found these at uh, dripworks.com. And I don't know if anybody else has them or not, but that's where I found them. And uh, I love these things. Essentially, and this is an elbow here. You just push the tape on right here. It just fits right over this piece of the fitting. And then this piece of it just screws down over the top of it and locks the drip tape into it. Uh, real fast put on, um, works well. I have yet to have one come off. And I've got a lot of them. Uh, and I've also started using some of these fittings on the uh, poly tubing that we'll uh, talk about here in just a minute. Uh, but it has the couplers, the T's, valves. Uh, the valves I have found um, aren't exceptionally strong but everything on it's plastic. And I found that uh, the handle on it uh, does have a tendency to break off over time. Uh, you do have the male and female connectors. Uh, this is actually the termination end for your drip tape. And it's a little bit different and actually took me a few minutes to figure out how to use it. It's, it's almost hard to see in this picture, but one end right here is a little bit wider on the hole than this end is. And you slide the drip tape in the small end so that it goes all the way through and then fold it over. Uh, and I found it twice is what's really necessary. And then pull it back so it's tight and your tape will lock into this portion of your terminal. Um, it can always be changed later. Uh, you take it out and daisy chain another piece onto it. But that locks it down really good. And uh, I've had no leaks whatsoever out of these. Drip tubing comes in several sizes. This right here is the quarter inch drip tubing. You can see the emitters uh, and these bulges right here. What you can't see on this and what makes this so nice is that you can take it on a, a plant that has a large root system and you can wind it around that root system. And you don't see it here, but you can see the tube coming in here and it wraps around under this fabric in a concentric circle. So I'm actually covering a lot larger area than what you're able to see. Um, and again, very little water loss due to evaporation. Uh, the placement, uh, 
put it right at your plant. Um, the nice thing about this one is that I get those emitters spaced around the plant, so I'm getting water all the way around the roots, not just on one spot. And they've got the uh, uh, same basic qualities as the drip tape. One thing I use this uh, quarter inch tubing for is in the, if I'm using a uh, uh, trough system, like a rain gutter planter or something like that, I can take the poly tubing as the main line, plug in the quarter inch uh, drip tubing and just run that along the trough and it waters everything inside the trough. Uh, it bends really easy. Um, so you can curl it around in and out of your plants, however you need to do it. Uh, this would also be a good one inside a, a flower bed where you need to um, just wind around in and among the flowers. It can be used for straight lines, curves, very easy. I've got some of this uh, quarter inch line that's been in for 20 years and it's still good. So it lasts a long time. Drip tubing uh, components. Uh, we talked about the quarter inch, which you can see over here. This is the half inch poly main line. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the drip tubing actually comes off that poly main line. And connectors, pretty much the same as everything else. These are the ones that will go on the quarter inch tubing. Uh, the barbed couplings, this is actually a goof plug. And goof being the key uh, word here. If you mess up and you put your hole in the wrong place, you can pop this plug in and pretty much it'll stop your leak. And you just punch your hole where you need it. You do have to punch this half inch line though to be able to use the uh, quarter inch lines coming off of it. We'll see an example of that here in just a minute. Uh, they have valves for the quarter inch line, which makes it real nice because you can control each uh, feeder uh, individually. And if you're using a quarter inch tubing that does not have uh, the emitters, you can put a dripper on the end. For example, if you have a plant in a small area and you only need water uh, in a small area, with one emitter, uh, you can put these drippers on there and it'll be very specific where it places that water. They come in uh, various volumes, anywhere from a half gallon up to about five gallons an hour. Uh, so you can pretty much size it into what that plant needs. The terminal end, you have two methods on the half inch poly. You've got a figure eight terminal. Uh, basically, you just pass the figure eight, slide it down. One side of it, slide it down on your uh, half inch line, bend your half inch line over so that it crimps and feed your uh, figure eight back up into it so that you've got the long end coming in one side and the short end coming in the other side. And it's actually the crimp that holds your line together and uh, keeps the water from leaking out. Or you can use the same uh, fittings that I showed you on for the drip tape. Uh, and they work the same way on a half inch tube. Put a, a male end on, you put a cap, which is hard to see here on the end of it. The nice thing about that is, if you ever want to daisy chain it down the road, you just put the female fitting on the other side, just like a garden hose, and just screw it on. There are other fittings that are a lot cheaper than those uh, Easy Connect fittings. And these screw on, you can see the screw threads here, and they just screw into the end of your half inch tubing. Um, they also have them for larger sizes. If you want to use a one inch tubing, they have them for that as well. Uh, they're very easy to use, very cheap, and Home Depot keeps a lot of them in stock, so they're easy to find as well. Uh, I don't know about any of the other stores, but uh, I know that Home Depot has it because I get, get mine from there. But one thing I would caution you about these fittings here, uh, I have had a couple of them slip off, even after being screwed in, and usually that happens when the tubing is hot and it uh, uh, moves real easy, it gets soft when you put the fittings on. So I've taken to putting a clamp around each of these ends just to hold the tubing on. And then you would take your quarter inch line, punch your hole in the half inch line here or inch, whatever you're using, and then use the barbed connector to put those together. If you want to use a valve, uh, 
one thing I found is don't ever put the valve directly into the half inch line. Run a small piece of quarter inch in between the half inch line and the, uh, and the valve itself. And the reason is, it's not that it won't work, it's just there's not enough room for your fingers to get in there to move the valve. So give yourself a couple of inches leeway in there where you have room to, to work with it. Timers become very important on any irrigation system. Uh, if you've been to the Master Gardener class, you've heard Catherine use the analogy of neighborhood kid watching your garden while you're on vacation. And the day before you get back, he runs out there and waters the garden real heavy like he's been doing it the whole time, except that for two weeks, it's dried out, everything's dead. Uh, timers make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, it makes sure that your water is on schedule. And there again, uh, doesn't alleviate you from watching the weather. So I'm going to jump down to the bottom here because just because it's on schedule, you still have to watch that weather. Uh, they're very good when you're not going to be at home to water. Uh, I like them because they really take the guesswork out of it for me and I don't have to remember to go out and water the garden on a particular day because the timer is going to do it for me. Uh, they come with a variety of functions and prices and the pricier you get, the more functions you'll have and vice versa. Uh, I have a lot of uh, very cheap timers that I use that I have to turn on manually and they go up to about two hours of watering. Uh, and I don't mind that on most of the garden because, well, frankly, I'm uh, out there enough that I see what's going on and I'm checking the soil constantly, but I do have a lot of systems that I use a timer on that comes on a certain time of day and goes off uh, pretty much routinely. Uh, the cheapest timer, uh, the one I was just talking about, costs you about $10, well worth the money because you can turn the water on. Uh, if you forget to turn it off, it's not a big deal because it shuts it off for you. Uh, that doesn't mean that you're hose bib or your hydrant is turned off, but it does stop the water from going into the garden. And you can get some very elaborate timers. Um, and you'll see these if you have a lawn watering system. Those are about as elaborate as they get uh, for a home use uh, system. Uh, not necessarily needed for a garden, but depending on how you want to set yours up, they can be used as well. But there again, it doesn't stop you from the need to watch the uh, uh, weather, because weather is critical and you may have to change the settings on your timer depending on how uh, dry it's getting later in the summer in particular. Several drip system designs. Pretty much on drip tape, this is all you're going to have right here is straight line systems. Uh, water comes in here into a trunk line. Uh, this normally would be your half inch poly line or one inch depending on what you're using. I would suggest putting a valve at each of these so that you can turn them off individually. And then you'll get your line coming down with a termination of your choice at the end. Uh, you may have, like I have on uh, one of my gardens, uh, that system with the quarter inch drip line coming off of it. Uh, this I'm using primarily in the lavender field where I have a lot of things in a single line with large root systems that need a lot of water. You can also use uh, a drip tubing and they have the quarter or the half inch poly uh, just like this except it has emitters in it. And uh, you can use that to make any kind of design that you want. Uh, spiral, concentric circles, uh, you can even run them together with fittings and make circles circles within circles, uh, whatever you want to do with There again, a valve so that you can control each one, run your design, termination at the end. And I'm at the point now that I found that I like to use the uh, male fittings at the end instead of just crimping them off uh, in the large gardens. And that's mainly so I can daisy chain another piece onto it down here if I need to. Now, this is one of those systems that I just showed you with the uh, straight line coming out of it. It's just upside down. So you've got your T here coming off of your main line where the water comes in right here with the male, uh, female fitting or male fitting, female fitting on this end 
elbow, and that goes in to the main trunk here. Trunk here with a valve, so I can shut it off. And then the quarter inch trip line wrapping around a lavender plant here. Uh, the reason I have valves on these is this particular trunk here extends about 100 feet. And each of these feeder trunks here go down about 250 feet. So I found that uh, with water pressure coming off the hydrant, I can't run more than about five of these lines at one time. So I've got to be able to shut off the others when they're not in use. So that's pretty much all of the presentation. And I hope I answered a lot of questions, but if you have some more, uh, be more than happy to take those now, or if you're looking at this through the archive, you can send your questions to lcmgardeners at wyoming.com, and somebody will get back with you with an answer to whatever it is you have to ask. So, Catherine, I'll turn it over to you. Mike, thank you. That was a very informative presentation. I do have a question for you, and it's from Bill. How well do rain sensors work with drip systems to control the timers? Wow. <laughs> that was unexpected, Bill. <laughs> you know, I've never used one. Um, so I really don't know. I, I wouldn't be able to answer that. Uh, Captain, have you used a rain sensor at all? You can, it gets a little more high tech and involved with it, but you can hook up a, um, a tensiometer that goes into the soil that measures the soil moisture and that hooked up to a computer can, <laughs> can turn off the irrigation system if it senses that there's too much water, which can sometimes be a lifesaver for your tomatoes, which don't like to be drowned. They don't like a lot of water, but it, it, it takes a little more fancy equipment. And I've got, I have a Dripworks catalog in front of me here and I haven't seen a sensor, but I'll look a little bit more for that. And Mike, did you talk about pressure reducing and, and why you need a pressure reducer? Yes, I did. Okay. And then, um, any words of wisdom for putting a PVC system together? Yes, as a matter of fact. Um, I've got one of those. And let's see if I can go back. I've got a picture of it right there. Um, as you can see, this one's not installed yet. It's still waiting on this, the overhead spray system. Um, but this is a PVC system that I've set up. Uh, it's been in probably 15 years now. And I made a huge error with this system that I'll warn you about. Don't ever use white PVC. Uh, it does sun rot. Uh, and when it breaks, it just, it's like a bomb going off. It just shatters and goes everywhere. Uh, it deteriorates so bad and you won't necessarily know it until it breaks. Uh, if you're going to use PVC, first off, use the gray PVC that is intended to be outside. It's for electrical, um, everything, fittings are all the same, but it's intended to be in weather. So it'll hold up a lot better for you. Uh, there's all kinds of fittings for it, and then you can take all the systems that I've talked about here and connect them together. And it's kind of hard to see, but there's actually a valve right here, which is a standard garden hose valve um, and other than that, PVC is easy to work with, uh, cement, primer, a pipe and a hacksaw, and, and you've got everything you need for your system. Any other questions? Um, so if you had any experience with a pressure regulator not working and causing problems and either the, the drip tape or the soaker hose? I've never used it on soaker hose, um, but I've, used, I've got several of them running on drip tape and I've never had an issue with one not working. Okay, what, what level of P, PSI do you have 
do you take your system down to what what's the reduction that you want well i've got the heavier tape so i can go to a 15 pound uh, regulator but they do make them smaller and there again it depends on what tape you're going to use um, i got the heavier tape because frankly i just didn't want to replace it as often as you probably would have to with the lighter tape so i'm i'm looking at the catalog here and the drip tape has got a, a pressure that it, it can't exceed 15 PSI. And then there's some mm -hmm. others that, um, that take 12 PSI. And, and so from my personal experience, I found that having a pressure reducer on there and you've got your, your next slide, your slide number 10, if you could go to that, the Would drip tape. That? Yep, go to the next slide. Yep. So there's your pressure it's reducer pressure right reducer, there. Right. And then could you talk a little bit more about filters and why you want to filter on your system? The filter, I did talk about it, but it's basically to uh, take anything that's coming into your system. It could be particulates, uh, either dissolved in the water or uh, dirt that's got into something and it'll, t it'll catch in this filter. Um, and Frankly, I've never had one clogged. You can drain it here and then clean it out and wash it. Uh, the whole filter pack, this casing will come off and you take the filter out and wash it. Um, and I wash mine every year, but I've never had anything washed. And there is one thing that one thing I want to mention here though, uh, just because it seems to be a good time to do it. Right here, is a fertilizer injector, which you can't see because it's actually over in here. You want to make sure that you have your pressure regulator on the outflow side of that fertilizer injector. And the reason is to uh, pull the fertilizer up takes about 50 pounds of pressure. So to get it out of the uh, container is going to take a higher pressure than you can actually feed through the system. So once it gets out of the tank, it's fine, it can run at 15 PSI, but you gotta have that amount of uh, pressure to get it up. So just make sure of the placement of your fittings when you're putting everything together. Okay, so from Rick, says I've had luck with painting the white PVC. And so that's kind of a cool comment and I'm glad he brought it up because there's all sorts of spray paint that you can buy and it comes in a plethora of colors. So you can actually have quite a bit of fun with this. <laughs> but you can spray paint your PVC different colors and and spray paints not just for teenagers it's it's for us adults too to have fun with <clears throat> so I'm thank you bring that up right yep um, and then from David how do you protect your irrigation system in winter and also from being damaged when weeding or cultivating <laughs> so okay, well, in the winter, I just take it down. Um, now I don't necessarily store it inside. Uh, I've got some shell sheltered areas out in the yard that I take it down and put it in those areas. And uh, the drip tape lasts, the uh, drip tubing never comes in. And like I said, I've had drip tubing and poly tubing has been out for 20 years now and it still functions fine. And it's got the uh, single unit emitters on them. Uh, the PVC is the same thing. I just pull it off the side and put it in a sheltered area. Uh, probably why it's not lasting. I don't know, but I don't take it in in the winter. As far as cultivating, uh, depends on how you're going to cultivate. Uh, I do all mine by hand where I have these systems in. So I can just pick the tape up, move it off the side, do my cultivating and put it back or just cultivate underneath it. So Mike, have you had um, any experience with having to repair drip tape? Yeah, uh, I talked about that a little bit. Um, the best way to do it and also the most expensive is to put a splice in it and that's the coupler that you see right here. Um, and they're not terribly expensive. It's just they're, if you've got a catalog, Catherine, what about a buck and a half, two bucks a piece, something like that. And you got to have one on hand, which means you've got to keep a stock of them. 
Um, or the easy way that I found to repair uh, drip tape is just to take some plumber's Teflon tape. That's that white tape. Uh, usually comes in a uh, blue and white uh, container. And wrap that around there, about two layers thick, around your uh, uh, leak. Now you want to make sure the tape's dry before you uh, try this. And then take some electrical tape and tape it on and go about an inch or an inch and a half out on each side of it. So the electrical tape is contacting it. And uh, I've had very good luck with that. Okay, excellent. So I'd, I'd like to give everybody kind of an idea of what it costs to put in a drip tape system. And I don't have the prices for the PVC, but the drip tape itself, which is 15 PSI, and then eight, I like to use eight inch on center. Mike, what's your, what's your spacing? Do you go wider? Um, well, it depends on what I'm doing. Uh, what I've got in the garlic is about eight inch on center, but then I also use it out for the uh, um, other systems that are 30 inches on center. But I'm watering specific plants as well. And as far as the emitters go, I have six inch tape and uh, I plant everything either at six inches or 12 inches. Okay, so I'm, <clears throat> I'm looking at eight inch on center. So that means that there's a, a drip emitter every eight inches on this drip tape. And so that makes it really ideal for vegetable gardens. And a th it comes in a thousand foot roll. And so maybe some of you wanna go in together and, and, and share on this, but a thousand foot roll is $100, about $110. So it's not real expensive. And I've had drip tape that it's lasted me for 15 years. In the catalog, they're saying seven years, but I've taken care of it. And with the, with the uh, occasion of running over it with a lawnmower, which it doesn't really compatible, um, it lasts for a long time if you take care of it. And, and that filter is really important. This, this whole system right here, the, the pressure reducer and the filter is critical to these systems. And they're not, they're also not very expensive. And that the, the trio, and you can now buy them together. And so they'll set you back about $20. And so this is not gonna be a very expensive system, but it's going to last you a long, long time. It's gonna save you a lot of water. And when I do my vegetable garden, I put the drip tape underneath black plastic and then the black plastic helps hold the water in place and I lose less water I conserve more water doing that so Mike do you do you have any tricks that you do for helping to conserve the water on these drip systems well in some beds I use a, a real heavy straw mulch and uh, of course those are things like the garlic that I planted last fall um, but other than that uh, not, not really I just place it on top of the ground and uh, it upside down so that it's not flowing up it's flowing down out of the system and uh, I've had pretty good luck with it because uh, saving quite a bit of water and yeah. it puts it right where you put it so you're not spreading it all over the place and, and that's starting to get more and more important and again I'm I, I'm really kind of concerned that we're, we're kind of easing into a, another drought just based on the lack of, of snow and moisture that we've received so far this year. And we're just not getting our typical spring snowstorms and, and rain. So, so doing a drip system or a soaker hose system and trying to really capture and conserve that water and, and use, it's called precision agriculture, I think is gonna be really important and I see that Rick's got his hand raised. And... Uh, yes, this is Rick. I have a quick question. Uh, what's your source for the fertilizer injectors? Well, I bought my first one there from Dripworks and then I made the rest of them. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. It's just half inch PVC. There again, cement, primer, and a hacksaw, and you got it. 
Yeah, so in Dripworks, they've got a whole, uh, a little system that you can buy and it's, I'm looking at it and it's a little on the pricey side for me, but there's a, there's an injector line and it kind of aspirates the solution and it pulls it out of a, a bucket or a tub and it injects it into the irrigation system itself. So it's, it's called fertigation. And the, um, the injector, a low flow injector is around $40 and the bypass assembly is another $30. And so Mike is saying that he's, um, you made your own bypass, right? But you bought an injector. Yeah, the only piece of that I purchased was the uh, tubing the filter and the uh, uh, valve that comes with it. And you could really buy those pieces as well. I just chose not to. Um, and then I made all the rest of it, just copied what they already had. And it was actually pretty simple. All the parts are available in uh, Home Depot and probably in Lowe's as well. Yeah, you just need a little a valve that you can turn on and off and so you want the water to run normal and then when you want to pull fertilizer out of your system or inject it into your system you close that valve and then that causes it to go around and the water goes through the injector system and pulls and kind of just aspirates that, that uh, solution up and injects it into the system. So it's kind of slick, it's really easy. It, it's a really easy system. And we'll talk about this further in uh, future seminars. And so anything else, any other questions, thoughts, concerns? It's, it's actually a really easy system to put together and you really can't go, you really can't make a lot of mistakes with um, cutting and, and putting PVC together. You just need to have the fittings and have everything together, put it together. You know, it, it's just, it's easy. <laughs> I tell you, it's easy. Um, we'll I've done I'll quite a few. We'll do Make sure everything fits. Yeah, Rick. Uh, yes. Uh, when is our next uh, meeting going to be? It'll be Wednesday the 20th. It'll be Wednesday the 20th, same, same time, same place. And Master Gardener Michelle Bohannon's going to be on, and her topic is going to be gardening hacks or tips and tricks and how to be successful. And if you've ever driven by Michelle's yard, she's down on Evans, I think, and uh, her yard is just gorgeous. It, it's kind of like the house might be allowed to live there along with all the plants she's got in. So she's gonna have gardening hacks as the next topic. And I've, um, I've got that advertised on the Master Gardener website, the Laramie County Extension website and Facebook. And you can email me at cwisner, W-I-S-S-N-E-R, at U-W-Y-O dot E-D-U. And I can send you the, the link, the Zoom link, or you can pick it up off of our Facebook pages. But that will be the next one. And then the, there'll be one on the 26th of May also and the one on the 26th, that's a Tuesday, and that will be Kathy Shreve on container gardening. So the master gardeners are continuing to try to help everybody get through this and be successful vegetable gardeners and perennial gardeners and gardeners in general and more water efficient <laughs> along the way. So any other, any other questions, thoughts, comments? Mike, that was a great program. Thank you. Rick, go ahead. Yeah, one last question. Is there going to be a, a module or a section on hydrophonics? 
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was really, probably. <laughs> Mike, you want to answer that? Um, I do plan on doing well, but it's not going to be right away. I've got a couple other systems I want to get built first. Uh, so I actually have some uh, different slides uh, of different kinds of systems. I have some already, uh, but I do have some others that I want to build. And I'm in the process of doing that now. Okay, I'm, I'm just starting to venture into the hydrophonics at the present time. I've set one up in my greenhouse and um, it's all brand new to me. So I will be more than happy to share the pitfalls. <laughs> <laughs> I've probably made them all happy. <laughs> uh, hydroponics, I think, is really going to be the way of the future uh, for most of what things that we're doing. Uh, of course, it does have limitations. You, things like you know, wheat, corn, and such really aren't suitable for it. Uh, but for most of the vegetables that we're doing, it'll work just fine, I believe. I'm running uh, partially stinging nettle, peas, uh, geraniums, and I had oregano in it until I took it out and threw it away yesterday. Um, not because the oregano wasn't doing good, but I needed the space, and I was, oregano was just a test for me. Um, I am going to do a test on blueberries once I get the time to get that system set up. And I'm trying to, as I do this, come up with ways that people can build their systems and not have to go out and buy a system. Because these things can be horrendously expensive. Well, that sounds like a whole nother evening with Mike. That might be two or three evenings. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, maybe we'll we'll explore that one in June. <laughs> or maybe July. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's going to be a, a, a long one to write. And like I said, I've got some things I want to get set up first. I want to set the blueberries up uh, and at least get them started. And... Uh, and I want to go into a lot of things, uh, lighting systems, because Rick, I'm sure you've already found the lights on these things are, are horrible if you try to buy one. And I'm building uh, lights now, um, eight or a four by two by four light, uh, four tube light, and they've cost me about $75 to build. Um, and if I bought that light, it'd be about $400. Again, that's hydroponics, and we also have another master gardener on with us tonight who uh, grows hydroponically also, and so I may twist, try to twist her arm and join in the discussion when we actually do hydroponics. Um, any other, uh, let's see. So from, from David's iPhone, um, how important is soil structure in saving water? Well, everybody's soil is going to be different. So you can do a number of different, um, you can either send it out to have your soil tested or you can do a, um, get it wet and do a ribbon test on it. You can put it in a container of water, shake it up and see what you've got for soil. But knowing what your soil is, so if you've got a clay soil, you, you're going to adjust how you water you know, if you've got a sandy soil, that's different ball game. And so your soils are going to really dictate the length and duration of watering. And, and a clay soil holds water for a lot longer than a sandy soil. So you just, it helps to have, <laughs> so you can, it, you can be a geeky plant person and buy a soil um, tensiometer that tells you how much moisture is in your soil um, by by when it's fairly good, reliable, not a cheap one. And, and that will tell you, you know, precisely when you need to water or not. But clay soils are, are challenging. Sandy soils can be really interesting too. So yes, it does make a difference in what your soils are and knowing what they are helps a lot. And again, if, if you don't know, you can get in touch with us Laramie County Master Gardeners, you can get in touch with me at the Extension Office. 
Um, my phone number is 633-4383. And I love, to, I love talking soils and vegetable gardening and anything horticulture and green. So, um, yeah, get in touch with us and we can help you out on that. As you have, uh, if you have a clay soil, and I do out here, or I had anyway, um, one thing I found that helps is if you water lightly uh, on that clay soil, it'll bake down to where it's hard, particularly later in the summer. Water it lightly and then let it sit for an hour or two and then come back and water it afterwards. And a lot of times the water will soak in a lot better rather than just run off. Okay. And if anybody has any other questions uh, after the seminar is over, uh, feel free to email us and somebody will get back to you with an answer on that. Okay, so again, the next program is going to be 6.30 on Wednesday, May 20th. And then after that, we'll have one on Tuesday, May 26th at 6.30, and, and then we'll continue on to June with different topics. So we'll, we'll always be looking at something, and um, the Master Gardeners are, are, again, are here to help everybody. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Hope to see you back next time. Have a good evening. Everybody, everybody. have a good evening. Have a good weekend. Have fun.